Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Alex Cuesta Daily Show. I hope everybody is having a good time of it out there on this Friday, March 4th, 2022. Before we get down into any of the fun stuff, please like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars on Spotify and iTunes, and spread this word of mouth. Let everyone you know you like this show. Socials, go search the Alex Cuesta Show wherever you are, wherever you have a social, and it will pop up there. Now, I know anyone keeping score at home will be like, hey, Alex, you weren't here yesterday. Well, I got some funny stories for you on that, on why I did not do a show last night. But before we get to that, let's jump right into the Biden COVID tracker. Now, some interesting stuff in terms of the Biden administration and COVID. As of today, the Senate uh, passed a resolution to end the Emergency Authorization Act for COVID, I believe it's called the Emergency Authorization Act. It basically, it gives them the emerg- maybe the Emergency Powers Act. It gives them the emergency powers during the time of a pandemic or crisis to kind of maneuver a little bit differently, have a little more powers in terms of um, what to do, how to maneuver, yada, yada, yada. And the Senate passed it. Now, the Biden administration flat out came and said, if it comes onto my desk, I'm going to veto it. And it's definitely not going to make it through the House where it's so heavily controlled by the Democrats. Now, what is the significance of this? The significance is, as I've been telling you every day or most days, because I haven't been around every day, but as I've been telling you most days, numbers are starting to dwindle. This is getting much better. We are certainly out of the pandemic phase and they are refusing to give it up. They are refusing their reasoning. We need to maintain flexibility in, in, of if the next variant after Omicron is worse and so on and so forth. So what they're saying is we cannot give up more power over our constituency, over the people in fear that the next variant is going to be worse than this one. Although this one has not been effective at um, half as deadly or even you know a fraction as deadly as the other ones, and people are already going about living the rest of their lives normally again, but they don't want to give up the power. And this is exactly what people have been warning against. Now, a lot of the mask mandates are lifting. There is no vaccine mandates, but they're getting what they want. Realize this. They were able to get more power. Just think about the things that I've reported here about ID.me in now 28 states. It's going to be in Washington. Um, the um, central bank um, CBDC, central bank digital digital currencies that America is working on, a way to control, make everything digital. Yeah, it's so much easier. It's digital. You'll pay for no problem. But then they can actually control exactly how you're spending your money. If you're allowed to spend your money here and shit like that, because don't get me, don't don't think it's not going to happen that way. ESG is coming to more than just the hedge funds. It is going to start being in all of our lives, ESG. So be ready that you're going to sit there and want to go get a Happy Meal and they're going to say, mm, sorry, your ESG is a little low and you're not looking that fit anyway. Your money's no good at McDonald's. How about you go to a Whole Foods and support Amazon? Because, you know, Amazon supports ESG. They're great there. Keep on going to them. Or you want to frequent a place and that place doesn't have a good ESG score. And they're like, nope, your money can't go here because they're getting penalized um, because their ESG score is bad. You cannot patronize this place. It's coming. That's coming. And then on top of that, you have the smart health card, the vaccine passport. It is a vaccine passport. They rolled it out. So although they're starting to lift all these little mandates, the powers that be, um, the governmental actors, all those types of people are still maintaining their power in other ways. They're going to continue to have it. They're going to continue to have more power over your privacy and over the things that you hold dear. So when keep on the lookout for that. And then things like this also are concerning. The Biden administration is not ready to give up power on this yet. Everyone else knows we are out of crisis mode on this. Everybody else knows we are at endemic level, at the minimum at endemic level, but they refuse because they need flexibility. Like they couldn't just get like they couldn't just get this uh, act rethrown in because they, you know what their fear is? Their fear is that they know that if they give this up now in November, there is going to be a, a freaking I'm not going to say red wave or red tsunami because I think that's stupid. I fucking hate the red and blue label to begin with. But they know that there is going to be a shift in Congress 
especially with how bad Joe Biden does at everything that he does and the fact that nobody likes Kamala Harris either. So it's not like they really have anything going for them that way. But they know that's going to happen. So they fear what could happen if they relinquish this power. You know, maybe come November when it does shift, they'll get in in January. They could do something where you say, hey, Joe, give back the fucking power, you dickhead. You're done. But they're going to hold on to it for as long as they can. Mark my words. Um, so let's go on with without further ado about the numbers here. So we were last with you guys on the second two days ago, and the cases were at 79 million five thousand six hundred thirty two deaths were at nine hundred fifty one thousand seven hundred seventy eight. As of today, we're going to give you a two day running average. I'm not I didn't look yesterday. The cases are at 79 million one hundred nine thousand seven hundred ninety one. That is up 104,000, um, one, 159. That's a two-day average of 52,072. Again, trending in the right direction there. Deaths, 955,290. That's up 3,512. Two-day average of 1,756. A little higher than I last reported, but still in a much more manageable number of deaths. So we're going in the right direction on this, and they refuse to give up power. Take note of that. They do not want to give up power. So I kept on alluding that I have a funny story about why I didn't record yesterday. And it's not really funny. It kind of fucking sucked. So I'm going about my day yesterday. And I go to go and uh, clean off a few dishes. And I turn on the water. And there's times where, you know, water, it takes some time every once in a while to get some heat up. And I'm going, I'm starting to do dishes. And the heat never comes. It just doesn't come. So I give it a few minutes. I let it run. I go and run a few more faucets to see, hey, maybe maybe it just needs a little jump start. Maybe there's something like an air bubble and it needs to work its way through. So let me open up more pads and let it work its way through. Boom, boom, boom. Nothing. They are all cold. Now, the problem I face here is I also have baseboard heating, which is powered through the water system, getting heated and then pushing out the radiant heat that way to heat my home. So if I don't have hot water, I don't have heat, and I have two young children in the house. So I go downstairs to check my hot water heater. It's one of those instant heat wall units, whatever it is, the newfangled ones. It's not your stand-up boiler. Um, It's supposed to run more efficient and better. And I look, and on the screen that comes with it, the temperature is steadily dropping. Now, this machine usually runs anywhere between like 150 degrees and 180 degrees, 170 something degrees while it's in, while it's kicking. And I've had my heat on, obviously it's winter. So this thing should constantly be doing something and it is dropping and dropping. And I'm just looking at it, waiting and hoping that it's just a minor glitch and it's going to jumpstart. No, nothing. So I get a technician out here. The technician comes, checks it out and goes through a gamut of diagnostics. And when I tell you he got, he, he sat there and looked at it. It's kind of like, you know, I'm a little stumped. I, with the wiring right now that's going on this, I haven't looked at these um, units that much. They're still fairly new. Let me call a guy that I know. He's a guru, calls the guru, explains it to the guru. The guru is like, ah, I don't know what, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at my wits here. Let me connect you with a guy who is not a direct rep to the company, but knows people, gets connected to that guy. That guy calls not only a direct rep, but somebody that is um, very internal in the company in terms of how these things are built. The guy is uh, somebody that helps design this actual unit and shit like that. Gets those two guys on the phone on a three-way call. And they are going through diagnostic after diagnostic after diagnostic. Comes to a point where both men, including the technician that was out there, are kind of like, we're at our wits end here. You know what? Actually, try this one last thing. And they did. And it ended up being fuses were fried. And that, you know, he went out to go try and find fuses. He tested them. There was another short. That means that the motherboard is fried. Long story short, I was fortunate with the pricing, not going to go into that. Long story short, though, I had no heat, hot water or heat at all in my house last night. So there was no way I was going to be able to record it, not because I'm cold, but because my priorities lied with 
getting a heating blanket in the living room, laying it over some mattresses so that my two daughters can sleep in relative warmth. And thank God in our fireplace, which isn't functional right now because it has some problems. We have the little, one of the space heaters, that the faux wood ones that light up. Thank God that thing ran all night and ran at full blast. And the kids were able to get some sleep in relative comfort, but overall it was a shitty experience. And it's something that, you know, today we're up and running. He came, um, came back, brought the motherboard and another device, uh, hooked them up. Thing is now running beautifully. And I'm extremely thankful that it is running well. And, you know, it just really makes you think. And I said to my wife today, I'm like, you know, you never, ever know how much we rely on some of these things and how fortunate we are to have some of this shit. A lot of the things, most of the things we have, we take it for granted every day. We wake up in America or in any developed nation, whether it's, uh, you know, Britain or any of the European developed nations or even, even, even terrible nations like China. It's a developed nation. You know, they're run by a fucked up government, but it's a developed nation. They wake up and they go and they flip a switch and they expect the light to turn on. They expect when they wake up to still be in a climate controlled house because their heat's on. They expect certain luxuries when they go to turn on a stove that it goes on, whether it's electric or um, gas powered, uh, you know, it goes on certain things that are luxuries that we just take for granted on the day to day. You know, let's just be grateful, be grateful for everything that you have, because I, you know, I did dishes last night in the freezing cold water, which sucked my hands. I couldn't feel them for most of the night. And I'm just thinking to myself. There was a time in history where this was the thing. You just washed your fucking dishes and it, the water was cold. You know, at best, maybe you can heat it up in a fire and, you know, heat it up a little on a fire and have warm water that way, which is probably how they did it if they wanted warm water. But if you were poor and you really didn't have that much time or that much luxury or that much wood to burn to make fire, maybe you only had the wood to make fires or enough wood to feed yourself. I don't know. But Still, there's a time where people would wash shit in a river or we just wouldn't have hot water or available running hot water. Running water is a freaking miracle too. clean running water is a miracle. And it's something we all take for granted. And, you know, it's just be thankful for the shit that you have, you know, even if it's not a lot, even if it's not a lot, you still have luxuries now that we've never had in history before. You have comforts now that we've never had in history before. It's, it's a bizarre thing. Usually, probably if you're listening to this, you're listening to this either on a smartphone or on your computer and you're sitting in your car or through your radio or you, know, you, have, you have a car. That, that's, you have a fucking car. It could be a beater, but you have a car. You get to go home to an apartment, hopefully, if, you know, or a house. And you get to go in and you get to sleep in relative comfort. You get to watch a TV, which in this day and age is probably a flat screen, maybe a smart TV, and you're in relative comfort. Be thankful for all this. And just continue to always realize that, you know, I don't want to give you the whole entire, you know, this is going to seem corny, but there is always somebody less fortunate. There is always somebody in the world, in your state, in probably your town, less fortunate than you are. So whenever you sit there and we all get down at things, there are times where we sit there and we think the world's too much or even just a minor thing that's been compounding makes everything seem like it's falling apart and you can't do it. And those stresses are real. Just because you have things doesn't mean you don't have stresses. Just because you know we have like, quote unquote, we call it first world problems. Yes, we have first world problems, but they're still legitimate problems. When you're used to living a certain way, it's a legitimate problem. And when you feel like those problems are piling up, just you know, maybe try and take that step back and remember, like, I have a lot of things in my life that other people don't. So try and be grateful for them. And kind of flows right into my article of the day because the left is always grateful when there is a good crisis to exploit. Now we're going to get into the article here, Alexandria. And let me just start with that phrase. Never let a good crisis go to waste is the phrase. Now I know it was said by Rahm Emanuel, Obama's um, 
chief of staff. I don't know if he was chief of staff. He was someone in the Obama administration, someone fairly important. I should probably look that up. Who, what the fuck Rob Emanuel did in the Obama um, administration. But um, he was credited for saying that. And he said it again recently with COVID-19. And the issue is he tries to spin it in a way to make it positive. But in their way, positive is, uh, yeah, he was the White House chief of staff. There you go. That's what he ended up being. He was a chief of staff. But in that way of they're making a positive, it's not a positive for the nation. Most of the things that they do are not positive for the nation. They're positive for a collectivist move forward. They're positive for a consolidation of power, but they are not positive. And the reason being is because they take a lot of this stuff from a guy named Saul Alinsky, who wrote the Rules for Radicals, which is a playbook for collectivists on how to take control and how to win against capitalists, the capitalist pigs and the wealthy elites. It is a book that a lot of these people have read on the left and swear by. And someone like Rahm Emanuel would certainly be familiar with Saul Alinsky. Now, if anyone goes and looks up this quote, they're going to see a whole bunch of shit saying that Winston Churchill said it, Winston Churchill said it, Winston Churchill said it. And I'm, I was curious about it, that he's, you know, that he's credited for saying it during the meeting with um, the Soviet Union and FDR. And it was at the end of the war. He was credited for saying it at the end of the war that, you know, don't let it go crisis, go to waste. As I dug in more, because this, you know, as much as Churchill was a wordsmith and had very good historical quotes, there actually ends up being no legitimate record of him ever saying that. There's hunches that he said it. There's inferences that maybe he said it in a closed room setting, but there's no direct quotes. There's no legitimateness. If there is someone that can find the direct quote of him saying it, where he said it in a actual um large, like, you know, a credible source that has the quote and where he said it and maybe other quotes to go with it in the conversational text, because I don't know, because a lot of those deals were done closed doors. And we know about the results. We know about snippets that came out of it, but we don't know full transcripts. If anyone can find the transcript or anything like that, let me know, because from all the research I saw, and everything I looked up, and I'm not saying I went into a deep dive on the research. I didn't start reading peer-reviewed sources and things like that, but you know, did a few searches. And I know, you know, Brian Stelter, you're doing your own research. You're wrong. <laughs> but it's the best way to do it. You search and you don't just use Google, you use Google, you use DuckDuckGo, you use a few places because they all give you different shit. They run on different algorithms. And I've seen multiple places. Churchill never said that. Now, why would a lot of sources claim that Churchill said that. It's because Churchill's remembered as a very positive figure for the war effort. And Churchill wasn't necessarily somebody that the left would like. So what do they need to do? Since Rahm Emanuel, Saul Alinsky are famous for saying this phrase, how do they muck it up? They take somebody who isn't necessarily on their side and credit them with saying it as well, because now they could say, well, listen, it's just a phrase that's said by everybody. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're saying it, that it's only a left wing phrase. And it's, you know, it's a negative connotation because it's left wing. Look at Churchill. Churchill said it, too. He was a war hero. He's not a lefty. Look at the guy. That's what they're doing here. And the issue is it gets regurgitated and regurgitated because that is that was the note of the day. Make sure Churchill, people think Churchill said that when he didn't. So be wary of that. So let's read this article. It is from The Blaze. It is by Carlos Garcia written today. It's Ocasio-Cortez says sympathy for Ukrainian refugees is a profound opportunity to get a pathway to citizenship for all refugees. <sighs> Never let a good uh, crisis go to waste here. Let's read the article. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Democrat of New York, said the Democrats should use the overwhelming support for refugees from the Ukrainian war to help get a pathway to citizenship for all refugees. Now, there isn't a quote here yet. She gets quoted, but that doesn't seem like something far off from AOC would say. Um, and that's a problem. That's a huge problem. You shouldn't be taking in refugees with the intent of getting them citizenship right away, especially people like Ukrainians. I'd imagine a lot of the Ukrainian people are hoping to get home someday. 
someday soon. They're hoping that this ends up as much as it's not going to. They're probably of the hopes that for whatever reason, Putin's going to be deterred, pull out, and they can go home. But there's no reason to give blanket citizenship to refugees because you're just taking these people in unvetted because you're doing an act of goodwill when you're taking in refugees. You don't just grant them citizenship right away. You need to figure out if they're worth their salt, if they don't, if they're good people, if they're criminals, if they have any skills. And I'm sorry to any leftists. If you don't have any skills and you cannot bring a value to the country, stay here on a visa or a green card, figure out something and then apply for your citizenship. Because bringing in unskilled people that aren't going to add value does not help the country. And I'm sorry, if you're coming into the country, you should come in and help. Let's keep going. She made the comments to Rachel Maddow on MSNBC Tuesday after the State of the Union address by President Joe Biden. While Maddow asked Ocasio-Cortez, how do you use sympathy for refugees, for the refugees from the invasion of Ukraine to avoid demonization of illegal immigrants at home, the congresswoman bent the conversation towards amnesty. Hold on, I got to read that again. While Maddow asked Ocasio-Cortez, how do you use sympathy for the refugees from the invasion of Ukraine to avoid demonization of illegal immigrants at home, the congresswoman bent the conversation towards amnesty? Why the fuck is that even a question? How do you get refugees of war and even you know of course you have sympathy for refugees of war but how does that even equate to people coming over illegally from other countries they're not coming here illegally if you're a refugee that means the government is agreeing to take you in you don't just sit there and come in illegally especially in a wartime situation Right now, Poland is getting the whole brunt of it. There's been a million people have come to Poland. Poland is going to ask other governments if they are going to take these people and they will disperse them. All a million aren't staying in Poland and they will disperse them. I'd imagine some will come to the United States, but that is after agreeing with the State Department and the powers that be in the government to bring these people here. So, of course, you have sympathy for those people. It is nothing like the illegal immigrants that walk over the border on the Mexican border. Not a single thing. Let's hear hear what AOC had to say. And I will not do a squeaky voice imitator. You cannot ask me to do it. Maybe one day I will, but it won't be for this article. Let's go. I think that the way we are looking at the immediate granting of TPS to Ukrainian refugees, which is what we need to be doing, as well as many others, is something that we really need to keep in mind. Because I do believe that, for example, the thousands of people who try to seek legal refuge on our southern border, how Haitian refugees have been treated by the United States, not just in past administrations, but frankly, this one is not right. So you see how she just completely and totally shifts away from the conversation of um, the refugee situation. She, if you grant them temporary protected status, to which is what TPS means to Ukrainian refugees, we and we might as well do it to others. Why should we grant an illegal immigrant who broke the law to come here a temporary protected status? What what sense does that make? And again, using a good crisis, these people are in legitimate crisis. These Ukrainians are in legitimate crisis. They are pushed out because of a war. They're not trying to cross a border illegally because their country's economy sucks and they think they could do better economically here. That is not a legitimate reason to break into another country. That is like AOC being okay with the bum kicking in her door just because she has a nice luxury uh, place to live in Washington, D.C. And her saying, well, you know, my place is a lot nicer than yours. So you know what? You could easily some, come sleep on my couch. And he goes, no, bitch, I want to sleep in your bed. Your bed's nice. I want to be there. And her, she would have to say yes by her theory because we just need to allow everybody in and grant them citizenship. Let's keep going. And we really need to make sure that when we talk about accepting refugees, that we are meaning it for everybody, no matter where you come from. But I do believe that this also presents a profound opportunity because of the amount of extraordinary support for Ukraine and Ukrainian refugees, Ocasio-Cortez continued. So this prevents a profound opportunity because we can use the plight of people in legitimate crisis over war. We can use sympathy for them to compound it 
and try and make it seem like illegal immigrants are wartime refugees. Does anybody understand the level of fucked up that this is? That they're going to try and push to apart, push forward their political goals off the backs of people who are legitimately suffering, who legitimately left everything, everything they owned and were forced to leave. They didn't voluntarily get up and leave and immigrate here illegally, like all the illegal immigrants do across the border. No, they were forced to leave against their will. These Ukrainian people did not want to leave Ukraine. But no, we're going to use sympathy for them to push forward our political objective. How fucked up are you? Let's keep going. If we grant TPS to Ukrainian refugees, this is also an opportunity to finally create a path to citizenship for TPS recipients, she concluded. So I think that while there is a risk, there is also a profound opportunity for us to make the crooked path straight on this issue. Why should we give temporary protected um, temporary protected status? People have temporary protected status, a path to citizenship. It is called temporary protected for a reason before they can figure out things about you. It's a way to vet you. It is a way to figure out about your situation to see if it is a merit to you staying here. Now, the path to citizenship is crooked because it's meant to be difficult. They need to make sure that the people coming to this country love this country. Do the people coming to this country understand how this country was created, what it stands for, and why it's created? That's why it's difficult. It is not meant to be easy. And no, everyone, there shouldn't be a straight path to citizenship from the temporary label. There shouldn't because you are here temporarily. Let's keep going. Casio Cortez retweeted a video of uh, a video of her immigration comments by someone who tied the proposal to abolishing ICE and fighting racism and uh, fighting racism and white supremacy. I don't understand. She retweeted a video of her immigration comments by someone. So, yeah, I don't understand how tied the proposal to abolishing ICE, fighting racism and white supremacy. How are you fighting white white supremacy by letting white Ukrainians in here, you stupid motherfucker? Uh, What is a white supremacist going to like that? That has nothing to do with that. And fighting racism again. So you're using white Europeans to push your proposal forward for colored people. It's racist, honestly. It is racist to do because you're using race in order to push your agenda ahead. You don't care that these people are in strife. You can give two shits about the Ukrainian people. You're looking at it. You're you're using them for political gain. Let's keep going. It is estimated that about 1 million refugees have already fled from Ukraine as the Russian military attacks civilian centers and more are expected as the war drags on. And then they put a video of AOC up here. I do not want to play that video because I cannot listen to her voice and the dumb shit that comes out of her mouth. But that is the article. And man, if you can, if you can get on board with that, what type of person are you? Like, break it. Like, this is not coming from a place of sympathy from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. This is not coming from a place of sympathy for the Ukrainians. This is not coming from a place of sympathy for the Spanish and Haitian people and Serbian people and Russian people and all sorts of other people that cross the border in the South now because they know it's wide open. And, you know, Middle Easterners that are also coming in as well, they do not all have good intentions for this country. I'm not saying that all of them have bad intentions. You know, there are illegal immigrants that come here that just want a better life. I'd say majority of them do, but they're still doing the wrong thing. It is still wrong. And, for the ones that are coming in intending to do the wrong thing, AOC is in favor of just giving them amnesty and letting them all be citizens and letting them all come in and do whatever the fuck they want. It's such a bizarre thing to buy into unless you have something to gain from it, which AOC certainly does because the left feels that by pushing for this and giving these people amnesty, you then put them on the government teat because they will come in poor. And you put them on the government T and those on the government T always get promised more by Democrats because they want to be able to control them and continue to get their votes. That's how this works. They're never going to encourage these people to get jobs, even if they become citizens. 
They're just going to tell them how hard it is because of their skin color that pe- white people are holding them down. So you need to continue to vote for us. So we can give you more from the government so that white people can't hold you down anymore. That's their logic. And it's bizarre that she is using sympathy for majority white people to try and push this agenda. It, it's it's I, I don't. I don't understand how anyone can buy into this shit. Now, no one could see how fake it is. But people vote for her. And unfortunately, she's going to be there for as long as she wants, because now illegals can vote in New York City. So AOC ain't going nowhere for a long time. And we're going to be stuck with her. You know, this isn't an idiotic opinion. People can look at this and just be like, yeah, she's a fucking moron. This is a dangerous opinion. And I'm not going to say it's dangerous and needs to be censored and it's violence because that's just fucking stupid. It's not violence. Words are not violence, but it's dangerous in the sense that she is trying to find a loophole. She is using a, you know, lies and she's using sympathy and she's using emotion, which Democrats are the best at playing at, but she's using all these things to try and push forward an agenda. This is all politics. It has nothing at all to do with compassion. So there it is. There's AOC doing her own thing, being herself. I appreciate everybody for listening to the show today. If you like what you heard, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate it five stars. And that's on iTunes and Spotify. And also spread this word of mouth. Find us on socials, the Alex Quest, the show, anywhere you can find it. And hopefully nothing freak happens over the weekend. And I will be able to talk to everybody on Monday. Uh, maybe we'll get the show a little more regular again. How about that? Look out for the Alex Cuesta show. Obviously, always with my brother, David Cuesta. We have another great show coming up on Sunday. I'm deciding to release them on Sunday. So you'll be getting that on Sunday. Look out for the Alex Cuesta show. And as for me, I'll see everybody later. So long, all.